So welcome to the Dadpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Oliveira, and I'm really excited about today's episode. My friend and partner in several ventures that we're working on together, I'm working with his company in different capacities, Dan Gretsch. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. Absolutely. Dan helps businesses and marketers elevate their digital marketing game in a multitude of ways, and we're going to talk about that today. And I've been working with Dan for a while now, and I can tell you that he is not only an amazing, inspiring leader, but he's also very meticulous about his work. He beats himself up because he's a perfectionist, but I'm telling you, when you get to know Dan and the work that he's doing with BizHack, you'll understand well. Dan, introduce yourself to our listeners. Tell us about Dan, what you're doing these days, how you started. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, my name is Dan Gretsch, and I started my uh, career as a journalist. In fact, uh, some of you uh, who are longtime NPR listeners might remember this line, I'm Dan Gretsch for Marketplace. And I used to say that, I said that 851 times over five years as a foreign correspondent for Marketplace, worked with PBS, Miami Herald, Washington Post, and um, really... Uh, fashioned myself uh, a journalist and storyteller. I even got a master's degree in storytelling when in, in 2013, suddenly unexpectedly lost my job and had to reinvent and decided to reinvent myself as a business storyteller. And I realized that uh, business storytelling is, uh, is really another way of saying marketing. And so I said, okay, marketing, that's what I want to learn. And um, you know, arrogant guy that I was. I'm like, I'm a smart guy. I went to Princeton. I got a Fulbright scholarship. I was part of a Pulitzer Prize. I have two master's degrees. How hard can marketing be? You know, I, it'll take me a few searches on YouTube and a couple weeks of effort and I'll figure it out. And well, <clears throat> long story short is here I am eight years later. I'm still on that learning journey, still learning about how to be a better business storyteller uh, but one of the things that I've been dedicating myself to doing, um, and I'll, we can talk about why if you're interested, is is teaching others uh, how to learn how to market their business and themselves online um, in a simpler way. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And that was my the segue to the next question is, how did you get into the education side? Because I love that story about your mom. Yeah. Well, you know, it turns out that I come from a long line of coaches and teachers. My father's side of the family uh, are all coaches and instructors. My great my grandfather was the head coach of several teams in La Liga, which is the Spanish soccer league. Uh, and he was so well known in Spain that when people walked past him in the street, they would tip their hat at him. Uh, that was sort of the old fashioned way of acknowledging my grandfather. And I remember seeing that as a kid growing up and visiting him there and seeing people treat him with such, I mean, he was a celebrity. My sister is now a soccer coach. My dad was my soccer coach and my aunt and uncle started a, the top gymnastics academy in, so, in all of Spain. And so sort of sports and coaching is 100% uh, uh, in the blood on the Gretsch side of the family. And then on my mother's side of the family, as you referred to, it's all school teachers all the way back. My grandfather uh, was the Mr. Mr. Marcus, a physics teacher in Philadelphia, inner city Philadelphia. My uh, uncle, my aunt, my mother, uh, my mother was an art teacher in the inner city Philadelphia for 35 years. My sister, after a year, a career as a coach has now become a school teacher. So it's all been coaches and teachers all the way back. And I have been teaching for 25 years, but what I've been doing is I've been teaching as kind of a, an adjunct career, a secondary career to my main career, which was journalism and then marketing. And I taught to learn. I always say, I like to teach what I wanna learn. So when I wanted to become a radio journalist after a number of years in print, the first thing I did is get someone to hire me to be a audio journalism instructor. And I did that at Princeton and Columbia and University of Miami and learned by like how to, to do by teaching. And I'm a big believer in being a teacher practitioner, which means teaching and doing. And by doing, you get better at the teaching and by teaching, you get better at the doing. And it's just this beautiful cycle. 
And I know, Alex, you're a teacher doer as well. You teach lead generation and you do lead generation. You run a lead generation agency. So you probably feel that. Anyway, long story short, in the last decade of my career, uh, I wanted to learn digital marketing. And so the first thing I did was conned my way into a teaching gig at Miami Dade College, the nation's largest college, and started teaching. But what I didn't expect is to love it so much. And I didn't expect for the demand to be so large. Like when I was teaching journalism, it was really hard to fill those classes. It's been much less hard to fill my classes in digital marketing. And and then, you know, for the last seven years, like perfectionist that I am, just continually refining and getting better uh, at teaching something really hard, but making it a lot simpler. And that that's really the one thing I'll just quickly say is the first part of my life and career felt really disconnected from the more recent part. The journalism felt very disconnected from the marketing but it's only really in the last year or so that I realized that they all combine into this one beautiful package, which is simple storytelling, which is making complex topics simpler. And I realized that, God, I had been doing that for my entire adult life, whether it was as a journalist covering complex, you know, market issues for marketplace and trying to explain them in 45 seconds or now it's trying to explain retargeting in language that human being can understand. That's my superpower, that's my gift, and that's the impact I wanna make in the world. If you, as a small business, understand how to market, you've unlocked the potential to do something bigger, to grow your business, to create the life for you and your family that you wanted. And boy, am I charged up by, about the idea of like making this simpler for folks. Because I know for me, it was, hard as hell to learn it. Yeah. And I've, and I've heard that so often from business owners, they have the desire to learn like they would accounting, HR, sales, all the different pillars within the business. But digital marketing is a really difficult one because if you think about it, the, the browsers, the devices, the algorithms, all those, change, all those things are changing and evolving every day. I always say when people ask me about SEL, I say, look, here's the thing about SEL. There are thousands of engineers as we speak working on changing that algorithm plus the AI, right? So how could I know exactly what the secret is? All I can do is educate myself, test, 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 and then learn. So I think that is the challenge for small businesses. But I know from working with you on your program, that there's part of that journalist in you where you're trying to uncover things and be accurate that lends itself to creating such a beautiful program with BizHack. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that I think you really picked up on is that um, the integrity of the information is really important to me and also not being beholden to moneyed interests. One of the things that frankly drives me nuts about marketers is that they're willing to present what looks like, you know, unbiased information really in the service of just selling themselves. Um, and I think that this is um, problematic when you're in an education space. Like you really wanna be able to trust that your, the company you're working with is working for you and not for someone else and not telling you or telling you, but still, you know, and my favorite example of this is about budgets. Um, honestly, many agencies and all of the digital marketing platforms want you to spend a boatload of money. And so whenever, whenever they have an opportunity to give you advice and to be generous, the advice could go either way, spend more or spend less. They tell you to spend more like any of the training, right? That Google gives you is broad match. <laughs> you know, like they're telling you use broad match and oh, there's this other thing, exact match and phrase match. You know, uh, with Facebook, it's the same way. They're always pushing you to expand the size of your audience. Uh, LinkedIn is the same, like it's just one button click, but now you're in the audience network. Another button click and now you've done audience expansion. Like their goal is to sell eyeballs. And secondarily, they wanna make sure that you make money. 
So they they pull themselves back because they recognize that if you spend money and don't make any money, it's not going to work. And one of the other things a lot of these folks will do is they'll give you better results on your first campaigns than you'll ever get. And again, they'll basically juice the algorithm for you so that you're suddenly kind of addicted to the juice. Uh, and, and then you're... So anyway, long story short is... As a guy who's coming from a journalistic background, that level of integrity is really important to me. I'm not beholden to anyone. I work for you, you know, my, the, per, you know, the person who's taking the program. Um, and we sit on the same side of the table and we work together to get you great results. Yeah. What about during the pandemic? So much has changed, right? Behaviors. Uh, I just read an article today about work from home. 72% of the employees that are doing the WFH work from home thing uh, want to stay work from home. And the, some companies are saying, uh, not so fast. You got to come back to the office, right? So for you, I know you had to make a pivot because you had that face-to-face -face when you were doing the workshops, the webinars, the master classes, and, and, and so on. And you made that pivot to fully online and you have a, you know, uh, an LMS, learning management system and a really good one at that, that is so intricate, has more information than you, you would ever need, but you've created your own sort of college university level and you're teaching businesses. So is that something that you're going to continue to do, Dan, or, or are you thinking that you get back to the face-to-face? -face? Because I know yeah. the universities are dealing with this challenge right now too. Yeah. Well, we believe that we've created in a space that's very crowded, a pretty unique offering. And when I talk about what are our three uniques at BizHack, it's content where we take difficult concepts and make them simpler. Amazing coaches who are working professionals who are every day spending millions of dollars in these platforms and then can give you kind of up to the minute, real life earned experience shares and then a community of other similar folks who are equally dedicated to growing their business. And we really believe that this combination of cutting edge content, top level coaching, and a really powerful community of business owners is unique. Not yeah, talk any, about talk about uh, the coaches, Dan, because I, I I know the other three are everything is great, but the coaches, in my opinion, just looking at it from an outsider first and an insider, and hearing from your participants, the students, what I keep hearing is that that is aside from the lead instructors being there teaching them week in week out. Uh, great, the curriculum is good, and you're right; it's been simplified for business owners to you know, learn it and then run with it. But what I keep hearing from a lot of these guys is the coaches. And so I don't think that it's just the coaches, because by the way, I've done that in my business in the past where we did corporate training and I'd hire, right, contractors to come in and coach. And I, I never got it to the point where I got that kind of feedback that, hey, Alex, your coaches are so amazing. What I would hear is like, yeah, the coaches are okay, but we really like working with you or Petro or whoever else is on our team. And what I've heard as far as feedback from the participants this semester is that they're just raving about all the coaches. So yeah. uh, t talk to us about how you came up with that um, strategy of using coaches. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, obviously. Um, let me start by just saying one other thing, which is, the key to our methodology is a learn by doing methodology where you actually run through a real life campaign. And what we found when we started, because adults only learn by doing it, all the studies say it. And frankly, seven years of doing this have shown me that if you explain marketing to someone, they'll remember 10% of what you said, no matter how entertaining and how good you are at explaining it. But if you force them to actually implement it for their business, they'll retain 90%. And that's when the life transformation happens is when they, you know, imbibe 90% of the information they need. Now, every business is unique and is marketed specifically to its business needs. And what we had developed is a very cost effective way of getting you 
to the specific insights that you need in order to be able to market your business. So we start out with course material classes that give you the 80% baseline that no matter what business you are, B2B, B2C, B2G, these are basic marketing principles you need to know. Then we say, okay, now go apply this to your business in a real life campaign. Go run a Facebook ad for your campaign, for your business. And then we have group labs where we workshop it. And that gets us like 10% more. But that last 10%, that last mile, it has to be done one-on-one. So that's the big insight is that you cannot personalize these real life campaigns without doing one-on-one coaching because everybody's specific issues are different. Whatever hurdles or mental blocks or challenges, they need to be done in a one-on-one setting. Um, And so that was the key insight is I I really believe that our coaches get such high marks because they're designed to solve the hardest problems, that last 10%, that last mile, right? They're like the mail delivery guy, right? <clears throat> you know, they're, 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 getting, they're taking it home for you. And so emotionally, you're like, oh my God, you saved me. You helped me get that last mile. But honestly, we took them 90% of the way there and they just led them by hand over the finish line. So emotionally, that's part of the reason. But the other thing is, I mean, I'll just be a little immodest here. Uh, I'm so passionate about this. I treat my people really well. We have incredible core values as a company, and I just attract amazing talent. And these are people who we hand pick. And the number one thing we look for is a history of volunteerism. I wanna make sure that these are people who are dedicated to serving others ahead of themselves. And so Ricardo, you know, one of our amazing coaches, he sings in his um, church choir and he volunteers for organizations. Cheryl, another one of our amazing coaches, uh, founded the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association, a local association. Alex Carvalho, one of our former instructors, he has been a major contributor to the South Florida social media ecosystem for two decades. You, Alex, you know, who I recruited, uh, handpicked, frankly, to be a lead instructor. Uh, I have a long history of uh, giving back and teaching classes. And God knows you don't do it for the money. So every single one of our instructors, first and foremost, is screened for a history of volunteerism. Number two, many of them have gone through the program itself and they're graduates and alumni of the program. And so they are believers in our system because they applied it in their own small business and it worked. So Yoel, uh, Mosquito Joe franchise owner, uh, was able to uh, get a 30 times return on investment on the ads that he ran while in the course. Um, Nathan, who runs a pest control franchise in Las Vegas, increased his residential sales by 25% year over year because of these techniques. And, you know, uh, Andreina, who is uh, oversees a, um, a, uh, a, a series of Pilates studios, was able to dr- dramatically increase all of the key metrics of her Pilates studio by using the tactics and the techniques and the what we call the uh, lead building system that we teach. And, and, and there's nothing more powerful than getting a business owner to be coached by another business owner who had success. So uh, many of our coaches are not professional marketers, but actually business owners themselves. And the, the class, is it goes pretty fast. I mean, it's almost like this whole new concept of like agile marketing that I've been hearing about for a couple of years now. Um, you know, these sprints and whatnot. And when I looked the way you were doing it, I had done a lot of these courses that are like weekend boot camps, um, two, three days, maybe a couple of weeks, but you're spreading a ton of information, really good information and doing the learning by doing, right? So they're running the campaigns and all of that over the course of 10, 10 classes, is it, right? Yeah. Right. So What's the feedback like from business owners, Dan? Is it, gosh, this is really going too fast because twice yeah. a week they're in class that they're doing the labs, they're doing the coaching, they have assignments. It feels like a ton of work for a business owner. Yeah. So how does that differ from being a business owner who's doing operations 
and then being a marketer. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's 12 classes over seven weeks moving forward. And what we've done is we segment the learnings into a nine step process and we walk them very systematically through those nine steps. And the, it is a lot of work, but it is the minimum amount of work that they need to do to successfully run a marketing campaign or actually two marketing campaigns because we do a awareness ad followed up by a lead gen ad. And our average participant actually in the course of those seven weeks is running more than two ads on average. So what we're showing them is all the thought that needs to go into running a single campaign versus random acts of marketing versus throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping something sticks. And we prefer to work with business owners, even though they're really short on time, because we've found that business owners who engage in their own marketing tend to get the best results. Our average participant in 2019 and 2020 had a 29 to one return on investment within three months of completing the course. So $29 in incremental revenue for every $1 an ad that they run. And a big part of our secret is we get business owners to engage in their own marketing often for the first time. And it's transformational for them. For most of them, this is a life-changing experience and a business-changing experience. And our goal, our, you know, part of our mission is to, tr is to change lives and transform business. And so uh, we have developed a course that is intense, that pushes people, that overwhelms some people, but we're there to catch them. Um, we create a supportive environment to test and learn and fail and push forward. And we push them far faster and far harder than they would ever go on their own. And we force them to finally solve this perennial pain point for them, which has been marketing. Can't tell you how many business owners during our application interviews say, I have been struggling with marketing forever. I hate it. It's a necessary <laughs> evil. I don't know how to do it. I keep hiring these people and they charge me an arm and a leg and they get no results and I don't know why. I don't know who, even who to hire, how to measure success. And I say to me, I say to them, look, start with us and we will solve that for you. That will be gone forever. And now you can work, worry about who to hire and how to make sure they succeed. And marketing will not uh, be solved overnight, but the horrible uncertainty of not knowing and that terrible lack of confidence that so many business owners feel when it comes to marketing their business, that we will obliterate. And you'll know what to do and who to hire and how to measure their success. And you know, not everybody you hire uh, is gonna be the right fit. I've been through three SEO firms this year, but I have the confidence to fire them quickly because I know what I need. I know if they're not delivering, I know uh, that I need to move on. Right. So Facebook, you use Facebook as the platform for them to learn by doing it when it comes to running ads. And some may say, well, that's great. You're using Facebook because it's the lowest cost per acquisition. It's the easiest platform. When actually it's the opposite. It's a pretty complex system. They just make it look easy. Facebook, that is. And I will give them credit for that. It's very robust, right? Whether it's the audience tools, the, the tracking and all of that. But what I've noticed with the, with the BizHack program is that you're going beyond just marketing foundation or digital marketing campaigns and ads. In the labs, you're answering questions about their website, about the tracking, the pixel. So talk to me about that because I think that that's a huge advantage for a lot of business owners that can't make that connection between marketing and technology. And boy, if you can't do that, tracking your leads and all of that, the marketing is not going to really help you so much. Yeah. There's a lot of thought that went into why do we start with Facebook? Why do we use Facebook as our teaching tool? And you hit on a couple of the points. Number one, Facebook and Google. And when we say Facebook, of course, we mean Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp and, manage, WhatsApp and Manager. And then they also have an audience network. 
so that's the Facebook ecosystem and the Google ecosystem, which includes YouTube and Gmail and of course Google search, those are the two giants in the industry. And no matter what business you are, no matter what size you are, no matter whether you're B2B or B2C, no matter what industry you're in, you must have a Facebook paid ad strategy and a Google paid ad strategy. It's just, you know, your customers are on those platforms. So to me, it's really a choice between Facebook and Google in terms of where to start. Second, Google, Facebook is complex, but Google, it's built by Google engineers for Google engineers, right? It's like Facebook really is built the better mousetrap. It's, it's much easier to use. Um, the complexity is hidden a little better. Um, and frankly, um, it's an easier tool to teach. And then fr finally, it's cheaper. It's way cheaper, cheaper than Google uh, and way cheaper than things like LinkedIn. Now, I think LinkedIn has actually done a really nice job of building an easy to use platform. But, fa but LinkedIn is also really limited. You're primarily advertising to LinkedIn or um, to their audience network. So you, want, you really can't reach as many customers uh, and it's not as broadly applicable to any business as Facebook is. Um, so that's why Facebook. The other thing about, um, you know, you mentioned that the labs are whole business. So what I tell our coaches is, I want you to coach from a whole business perspective. I want you to coach from a business owner's perspective. And if during these one-on-ones, if the participants are doing their work, and they're following the nine step process and they've kind of mastered the course material, which is the first job of the coach. The rest of the time together is fair game where you can talk about any aspect of marketing uh, or business ownership. But our, a lot of business owners will use random questions to delay and defer the work on the actual campaigns. And we don't allow for that. We, we say like, look, you're paying us to hold you to account holding you to account is running you through a nine step process. If you've gone through this nine step process, you will get results and we're not gonna let you cheat yourself out of those results. We call it show up and do the work. Yeah, it, in some ways it can feel like, uh, you know, they're back in school again, but not like, not, not uh, college, more like high school or middle school where you're kind of told what to do all the time. Uh, and I've heard some of that, but that's a good thing because the best programs are that way. As you know, I went through the Jim Moran Institute program years ago, maybe about five or six years ago. I've gone through the Stanford program, many business programs. I love learning. So I'm constantly doing that. And the best programs that I've ever had were the ones that really kicked my butt. And the, the, the instructors and the, the system that they built was like really hard. And I tell that to my kids all the time, right? Like nothing that's easy has any value. And when you walk away from doing something easy, it just doesn't feel like, yeah, it's okay. So I think with what you're doing, there's a level of, you know, that is challenging for the yeah. businesses. And I think that's a great thing. One of the other things, Dan, was- I'll just say really quickly, the analogy I love to use, because we get a lot of fitness studio folks in our program, because uh, this yeah. approach really works well with you know, yoga studios and Pilates studios. We've had Orange Theory Fitness. We've had Yoga 6. We've had Polestar Pilates. And they, th these fitness people really get this, which is, I can't lift the weights for you. Yeah. Like, you want to change your body? You need to push that weight. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to spot you, and then I'm going to inspire you to do further, faster, harder than you could yeah. have ever done on your own. It's a great and we, analogy. And we talk about this joy point. I, I would call in workout classes at the joy point. And it's that point, And everyone knows what I'm talking about who's done workout classes where you're like, I cannot go on. I am done. Right. I am spent. And oh, shit, there's 20 more minutes to go. <laughs> right? That feeling I call the joy point. And you know what's weird? You just find your way through it. And then you come out exhausted and feeling high. Yeah. elated. You know, the dopamine is kicking. So we have that same emotional experience, but it's spread out over seven weeks, which is actually kind of hard on students because the dip, which is a proven psychological experience of learning something hard is you get a dip. 
which is yeah. that moment in a workout when you're like, I can't do this. Yeah. That feeling of overwhelm and stupidity, that dip happens and it can last like two or three weeks. And we get people like really desponding because these are like type A, best in the class, like people who've done everything well. And we intentionally create an experience that pushes them to the limit. And sometimes they don't like it. But I say to them, show up and do the work, push through, follow the system, you will get the results, I guarantee it. And then they come out and you'll see, you're gonna have our, your first graduation uh, uh, next week with, with me as, uh, with you as lead instructor. And people, people's lives have been changed and, and yeah. they will say so. And, and it's like, we did that in two weeks, in two months. Two months, yeah. And, and I think like, the the way you've created the program to just in comparison because i've worked with lots of different programs at multiple universities at associations like sempo they're no longer sempo now they're like the digital analytics association uh omc i mean there's so many over the last 10 years at conferences you name it with the best people in the globe whether it's seo lead generation and um it's good. It's very technical, a lot of those programs. But I think what you're offering is really catered for businesses because you've created a sort of a dynamic system that isn't just running ads, learn by doing. It goes beyond that. One, one thing that for me was eye-opening, as you know, was the um, storytelling. Oh, we always hear about storytelling and marketing. But for me, Dan, as I, I've told you this over and over many times, that I was always over the last 10 years in the lead gen side of the business. It's just driving traffic, drive traffic, millions of leads. That's all the teams want. The sales teams, do. we want leads. Don't tell me about storytelling. Don't tell me about your SEO. Just drive traffic. We want the phones ringing. And when you and I started to work together and talk, you were like, hey, we need to work on your story. And you really helped me because I've taken other classes uh, for storytelling to become a better marketer. Um, but I'm not an expert in that area. And I think you opened up my eyes as to the importance of that. Now, what I will say is that a lot of my marketing friends, the lead gen SEO guys are like, screw your story, man. I want leads. I want sales. Nobody cares about your business. Nobody cares about your, your product. It's like, and it's like, no, but, but they do care about your story. Um, it's, I think, just how you tell it. So talk to me about the storytelling piece of it. Yeah. And uh, this is a great segue because the story of your business is the foundation of all marketing. And frankly, it's the foundation of a successful business, period. And look, there are a lot of technical marketers that ignore story and they do so, they're making a terrible mistake. And they're basically um, playing a different kind of game, which is uh, they're trying to sell their product on the basis of uh, other factors. To me, specifically when you're dealing with small businesses, but this is also absolutely true for Fortune 500 companies, people do not buy what you do. They buy why you do it, right? Why is an Apple computer able to be three or four times more expensive than a Dell computer? It's because Apple has done a much better job of telling their business story. Why is Starbucks, which sells, you know, colored water, you know, better, you know, able to, uh, you know, uh, to sell its coffee in tens of thousands of locations because they tell a better story. Why do, did Coca-Cola and Pepsi, you know, dominate the, uh, the other colored water industry because they tell a better story. And what we're, what we're, you know, IBM, you know, one of the kind of old greats has survived in part because they've gotten really good at telling their story. Whereas folks like GE have really lost the thread and are, are failing as a, as a result. Um, your business story is about your core purpose, the why, the what change in the world you want to affect, mm -hmm. right? And so many business owners are out of touch with why they do what they do. But if you have a, a, a really well-defined understanding of what motivates you to give up so much to run your business and what's driving that and what stories from your life you can use to help explain that motivation. And then secondarily, if you can really get at what your core purpose of a, as a company is, which is what change in the world do you want to affect? You're not just selling a product, you're talking about a movement now. 
And you're not just selling a brand, you're selling yourself. You are selling your values and your connection to your customers. And that is a, what it's all about. It's a human to human interaction marketing is. And so if you forget the human part of this, now this is just the foundation and this is the foundation for marketing and advertising, but also selling, invest, getting investors, getting banks to invest in you. You know, the one of the C's of credit is character. And character is telling your story and your motivation. Banks want to know, investors want to know that you're going to stop at nothing to make your business a success. They, un under, they want to understand your motivation, but that's not enough. It's merely the foundation. It's what comes next, which is the six pillars. That's so important. Would you mind if I ran through those quickly? Right, let's do it. So once you have the solid foundation of your business story, which talks about your motivation for doing what you're doing and the core purpose of your company, what change it wants to affect in the world, now you need to go and get it to people. And so the way you get it to people is through the six pillars of every campaign. And those pillars are your campaign objective, your target audience, your irresistible offer, your thumb stopping video, your compelling message, and the six pillars, your call to action. So I'll run through them really quick. So your campaign objective, what is your goal with this specific campaign? And this is usually either giving awareness or generating a lead or upselling a customer, but being really clear on what is this specific campaign trying to do? Is it getting them to click on a button, fill out a form, um, you know, message you. So being really, really clear on what is the result that you want Facebook or Google to optimize for and how to measure success. The biggest mistake I see from business owners is that they, their objective in their brain is different than the campaign objective set by their marketer. So the agency will say, okay, this is a brand awareness campaign. Our goal is to get, you know, people to like your Facebook page. And then the business owner is like, but I didn't get any leads or sales. Well, no, of course not. That wasn't the objective. The objective was to get <laughs> likes on your Facebook page. And so then the conversation should be, well, why are we getting likes on my Facebook page? Like that's a vanity metric. That doesn't help me. That doesn't serve my bottom line. This is the disconnect between agencies and, and marketers is uh, between agencies and business owners is often the business owner has a different objective than their agency and they don't talk or they don't define that together. So the defining your campaign objective determines your success metrics. Mm -hmm. Who is your target audience? You cannot try to target multiple audiences with one campaign. So you need to know exactly who your ideal target audience is and define who they are and then figure out how to find them online. Then you need to come up with an irresistible offer that will get that ideal customer to hop onto their phone, give you their contact information, download the thing, visit your website, whatever it is, you need to give something compelling to get them to do that, to cut through the noise and give them a reason to take the time to bother with staying in touch with you. Now, in order to communicate your compelling offer, your, your irresistible offer, you need a video. Video is the vernacular of the web. Video is what moves people. Video is what people look at on mobile. And whenever you have an option between a still image and a video, you gotta use video. Even in emails, you can have a click to a video, uh, you know, screen grab that then clicks to a video that will improve your results. Um, then compelling messaging is, the video itself is often six to 12 seconds. It's really short. It needs surrounding text that helps contextualize it and motivates people to watch the video and the click the call to action button, which is the last step in the process, which is pillar six is the call to action, which kicks them to the next step in their customer journey. And you can see it's a circle, right? The call to action leads yeah. to the, let's say, let's say it's a Facebook ad clicking to a landing page. The call to action is to click to go to the landing page. And then the landing page needs to have solid six pillars. What's the objective of the landing page to get them to fill out the form? Who's the target audience? It's that same customer. What's the irresistible offer? How, what is the video to uh, explain it in the compelling text? Once they fill out the form, what's the next step in the process? It's an email, most likely an email nurture campaign. So what's the campaign objective of the email nurture campaign and each email in that campaign? So it's a, it's a six pillar process that's iterative set on a solid foundation of your core purpose and your why. 
That is the BizHack lead building system. That's what we teach people in our course. That's what the nine step process systematically implements for a Facebook ad. And that's really the methodology we've developed. Now we're building out new courseware to apply the same foundation and six pillars to LinkedIn advertising, to content marketing, to email marketing, to all the different common channels, you know, Amazon, you know, to help build the small business ecosystem uh, around tools. But this is a system that transcends a tool. Great. So it, it's for me that I've been going through it, it doesn't sound complex, but I know if a business owner that's listening to this for the first time or a marketer who wants to elevate their skills, they're thinking, oh man, here's another system. It's obviously different than others. Um, how can they learn about this a little bit deeper to understand if the class is really the right class for them? Yeah. Here's what I would say. Our motto is business made simpler. Mm -hmm. but simpler is not simple because by, bottom line is guys, and I've been doing this for a long time, anything that is, says it's simple is probably selling snake oil. We got to be honest with each other that marketing is not simple. Marketing online is not simple, but it can be made simpler. And my big pet peeve is marketers either make it seem far simpler, <laughs> they make it seem simple and it's not, or they frankly make it way too complex. Super, super complex. Do you super see it? You don't yeah. see it, Dan. You see it, you don't, yeah. Yeah. So you, on one hand, you have the digital marketing bros and they're like, hey man, my name's Dan Gretsch and I have a simple six step process that's gonna make you money. Look at how much money I made while I was sitting here on this webinar. And they always have like cash yeah. in their hands. A they're Ferrari like, in the background. They're, they're driving in a yeah. car with a selfie stick and, and they're like literally physical cash, even though That's they're selling digital marketing. And I'm like, I'm like, F you, man, who the hell are you? <laughs> and then on the other side, you have like, well, what you really need to do is you need to set up the tracking pixel and then do a, s a series of complex tracking and uh, retargeting campaigns to, and you're like, oh my God, man, like yeah. that, that you, all you're really doing is mystifying a relatively simple process to get people to buy your services. What we really believe in is that this is something that anybody can learn and they can learn it fast, but that you need to spend time uh, and, and dedicated effort doing so. Before I ask you more about the course. Oh, you did ask how to learn more about it. So how to learn more about it. BizHack's YouTube channel, uh, bizhack.com, first of all, uh, has nice tutorial videos. We give away a lot of great material. And one of them is we have, a, I have a whole 90 minute webinar just talking about the lead building system. And I strongly encourage you to go watch that. It's free. Um, we also have a YouTube channel where we have literally dozens of sessions that I've run with marketers and including talking about the lead building system. And I uh, strongly recommend that you start there, uh, check it out at bizhack.com. And that will really tell you, first of all, what is, it'll build out on what I just spoke about, mm -hmm. uh, but it'll also really tell you, gosh, this really feels like a fit for me and I wanna learn more. And then you can just uh, contact us from there. And when, cause I know you do it, throughout the year. So when is the next class starting? Yeah. So we have programs that are running approximately every two months. Um, it's, we're talking right now in May of 2021. And so we have one coming up in June, another in September, uh, another in October and November. So we run uh, five or six cohorts a year. And as the demand increases, we're increasing that as well. Um, and we also are planning to introduce this sort of same process Mm -hmm. the, the six pillar process, uh, the lead building system process, but for LinkedIn, we're getting a lot of interest and demand uh, from B2B businesses on how to apply this process to LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, I would say it's tough, but it, you know, it's applicable both to B2B and B2C always, but um, it's like B2B, especially B2C. They're always fine being in the same 
place. But for the B2B folks, they're always wanting to, hey, I just want to be around B2B people. And I'm always trying to tell them like, look, it's not that it's all the same. Clearly, there are different industry, geographic location. There are so many variables that if, if you look to be in a room just with people that do exactly what you do, you don't re really learn as much. And watching other people do it really can help you and see it from a different angle. Because when you're just in your industry and that's all you hear, And I especially know this because of home services. And I'll try to put together a, a course that is for roofers, HVAC, painters. And a lot of these guys will say, well, that, that's not the same. And I'm like, no, home services, home services. You're all marketing to a homeowner. Now you want to be in the room with a bunch of people that are basically doing the same thing. Doesn't work that way, right? Even the journey sometimes is a little different. And you may think, oh, Look at that. I, I would have never tried that if yeah. I didn't hear that from a B2C in this example. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting right? point because there's, there's definitely benefits to being with folks who, there's benefits both ways, right? It's really helpful to have industry sharing because they're best practices that can apply across markets. But marketing is more similar than it is different. And I believe that there's a lot mm -hmm. to learn by looking at how other industries and even in other business types market, there's always something to learn. And, and that's where part of the uniqueness of the community we've built is we have, uh, we focus um, on serving, you know, fitness studios, home services, veterinary clinics, dental offices, um, kind of B2B and B2C businesses that have kind of a service orientation, but we bring in all types of businesses. That, 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 those verticals represent about a third of okay. the people who go through our program. And then the other two thirds uh, are kind of almost every business under the sun, uh, as long as they uh, qualify, you know, in our application process for having an established product market fit and, you know, uh, the right mentality to, to be a great participant. The, the one type of business we don't tend to focus on uh, are e-commerce businesses, because honestly, uh, we sort of assume that there's a salesperson involved. And, and that you're generating leads, not sales online. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had a few e-commerce companies go through a program and they've had great results too, but our real specialty and focus uh, is companies that uh, are more interested and focused on lead generation. Okay. As we get close here to the end, Dan, I don't want to you know, finish the podcast without asking you a couple questions about your entrepreneurship journey. Because in this podcast with the listeners, there's, yes, we're talking marketing, lead gen, trying to pass on the best recommendations out there for businesses to try. But the entrepreneur in every one of us is, is I always learn from entrepreneurs, right? So my question for you as it pertains to entrepreneurship is like, what is in your journey over the last seven or eight years here as an entrepreneur? And I'm, I'm, we could say that we're all entrepreneurs and have always been, I suppose, right? Because we're, we're creative we're, and whatnot. But for you, like what's, if you were talking to a, a, a new entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur starting out, what advice would you give them? <laughs> all right. Um... I know that's loaded. That's a huge question. It's a big question. I, I think where I'll start is I'm going to talk about my entrepreneurial journey from starting my business to today, which has roughly been four years. And I like to think of it in one year tranches. Like it doesn't, it kind of neatly fit, fit, folds into kind of year one, year two, year three. So year one was just getting some revenue in the door, kind of proving out that there really was a model here. I had been teaching a course at Miami Dade College um, and while working full time. So it was kind of like a, like a side gig. And I was just getting encouraged by cohort four and five by my students to say, they're like, God, this is amazing. You should really, you know, don't just do this for someone else. Start, you know, ma make it your own business. And so, uh, you know, I, I launched BizHack um, and started teaching the course as an independent course. And you know, immediately tripled the cost um, and couldn't get a single sale. And so I actually discovered my price 
by overcharging and then working backwards. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember I did like all this analysis and it was like $2,800. And I remember feeling so proud of myself and it ended up being 1999. <laughs> and then, and that was the reason why was I was an unknown brand yeah. and I didn't have great marketing channels and I just couldn't fill classes at that higher price point. But mm -hmm. Now we're at $3,500 three years later. And so I've been very assiduous about increasing the price um, at each step in the journey. It's, it's a slow process. <laughs> you know, it started out at $19.99 and then $24.97 and then $29.97 and then now $34.97. So we, that was number one is, is, is really year one is about establishing product market fit and testing it with audiences and just getting revenue in the door for me. Mm -hmm. Year two, and I bet, you know, I, I think I made $25,000. I paid myself $25,000 that year. I mean, it was less money than I've ever made uh, in my life. Yeah. Um, year two was about, um, for me, it was about experimenting with lots of different offerings. Mm -hmm. And this ended up, um, Actually, I'm sorry, year one was about experimenting with a lot of different offerings. And year two was realizing that I was spreading myself too thin and that there were certain offerings that were making me more money, the bulk of my money. And I also came to learn that it took just as much marketing effort to sell a three thousand a $2,000 course as it took to sell a $200 workshop. Mm. And that was a big realization that I was making a lot more money on the course than on the workshop. So I actually reduced my product uh, my portfolio of products down to just the one course mm -hmm. in year two. And the big insight for me is one of my mentors said, Hey, Dan, do you have unsold capacity in your course? Yes. Did you know that if you just sort of tackled that unsold capacity, you double your revenue next year. So that's what I started to do in year two is I just, I focused on marketing my course and less on teaching lots of fun courses. It felt good, but didn't bring me money. And I was able as a result to increase my revenue, not the double, but 50% mm -hmm. solely by reducing the number of products I was selling, doubling down on the one that was most profitable and doing a better job of marketing it. So that was year two, right? Year three was about COVID and COVID um, forced me to do something that I was planning on before because up until that point, I'd been doing in-person classes and I had a roadmap planned out for converting this to an online course. But what basically was planning on doing over six months, I did in three weeks as a result of COVID because uh, we were out of business with COVID. Yeah, we were an in in-person training academy. So, so we pivoted or, I mean, another way to say it is I accelerated a, a pivot I was planning yeah, uh, and we went from selling locally in here in South Florida to globally, and now we've had uh, more than twenty different countries, uh, including Africa, uh, Asia. Um, you know, we've had uh, folks from Ghana and Taiwan and New Zealand. It's been kind of an extraordinary journey. Uh, Pakistan, we've had two Pakistani students. London, mm -hmm. um, six countries in Latin America. So, so we've gone international um, by teaching online. Um, and so all of last year, uh, year three of the business was about pivoting to online, uh, in response to market conditions and beginning to scale the company nationally and internationally. And then year four, which is what I'm in now has been all about, uh, so we doubled revenue in year three. So year one to two, we went 50% increase by focusing on our core product and just doing a better job of selling that. Then year three, we took that core product online and we were able to double revenue. And now year four, uh, I brought on uh, two new team members. So we doubled in size as a team. Uh, I have a new head of operations. And right now we are basically positioning ourselves to scale. We have kind of a proven product, um, a, a proven methodology, the lead building system. And what we're looking to do is now take this and spread it to the four winds. And it's a little bit of a freaky moment right now for me as a business owner, because I'm, I'm actually, uh, my net revenue, my, my net income is, is in the, in the red because I'm investing in building a scalable platform. But I know, I really believe that once these investments, we call it plateau, then grow. 
once these investments have been made in, in scaling this, um, we're going to see rapid growth in our, in our, in our uh, revenue. So that's year four is really plateau and grow. And then year five and year six is rapid scaling. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I mean, from what I've seen, you know, working with you is just, you're very laser focused. Um, and anytime I see an entrepreneur who's laser focused, it's like whether there's a lack of funds, everyone wants more funds, whether it's from investors or from cash, positive cash flow. Right. But what I'm seeing is, and I tell this to a lot of entrepreneurs who I, I mentor, you, you need good people around you. And so what I've seen kind of tying in the coaches, the quality of the people that are around you in the program are very high quality and there's a cost for that. And so I made those mistakes early on, Dan, I think I've shared it with you before where um, in 2011, when I launched Predict, it was just get some bodies in here. And then three, four years later, I still had, my, my team had grown to 40 people. And I looked back and more than half of them were no longer a fit. What do you do? You just walk in and fire everybody? No, you can't do that. So you got to, what I did was I posed the question to everyone. Do you want to learn more and grow? I'll pay for your education. And I swear to you, and I had family members that were working for me too at that point. I think I had about six or seven family members, cousins, and they're great, really smart, but it wasn't, it wasn't their passion. So many of these people looked at me and said, yeah, we don't want to scale with you. So they, they walked away, right? I mean, I had one person who was a salesperson and I was giving her workshops to do. And she says, well, I'm not comfortable public speaking. I said, well, we're in growth mode. You have to do this. And she came in the next day. I kid you not. She came in crying the next day. Here's the laptop. Here's the keys to the yeah. office. I'm done. You've put me in a very tough place. I, I, I'm uncomfortable. And I said, oh, I, I didn't force you. I gave you an opportunity, right? Yeah. So what I learned then about year four, which is kind of where you're at, was, man, I just need really good people who are dedicated, passionate, and are going to follow me. And, and be a leader with me because I don't have all the answers, you know? And so, um, yeah, the yeah, advice me, that you're giving is really good too. Yeah, so. the, two, two, a couple things. One, it's, you know, right people, right seats. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you identified what your seats are on the bus and that the right people are in the right seats. And the way you figure out if the right people are in the right seats is GWC. Do they get it? Do yeah. they want it? And can they do it? And all three need to be yes, 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 or they're not the right person for the right seat. And I'm really excited to announce, actually, that we have brought on a new head of operations. Um, this is a, uh, a person that I've been speaking to now for more than six months um, who um, really understands the broader mission, the change we want to affect in this world to make business simpler, to make growth simpler for business owners. And... I really, truly, I mean, I'm investing in her uh, and her growth and her learning, uh, but also, you know, literally going into the red in order to be able to afford her because I am so bullish about having this right person in the right seat to counteract uh, and, and complement what I'm great at. So I'm a great communicator. Uh, I'm a really talented educator, but I get distracted you know, by bright, shiny objects. And, and <laughs> Welcome I, you know, to the club. Yeah, man. Like that laser focus wavers. You know? <laughs> it does. But the work you're doing is really good. I can attest to it. I can't say that for everyone that, that I meet and talk to every day, but um, I can definitely say that for you and whatever I can do or our community can do. Uh, we're here to help you. And I know that you have lots to offer. The goal is to give back to this community of listeners. And I think you've certainly done that today. So I encourage anyone who's listening to go to the BizHack website or to the YouTube channel and learn about the lead building system and the programs that they offer. Um, you've got my stamp of approval, Dan. It's been a lot of fun talking to you today and we're going to keep growing together. So thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And thanks for all that you've done and that you do for small businesses everywhere. You're welcome.